Justice Barrett? Let me pick up on the vacatur point. Uh, so one question I have, obviously the Chief and Justice Kavanaugh have pointed out that the Courts of Appeals, particularly the D.C. Circuit, have employed the remedy of vacatur for a long time. Why isn't it possible? And let's say that I agree with you and agree with some of the scholarship that says that this was not contemplated at the time of the APA's enactment. Why can't remedial authority evolve over time? You know, even if injunctions and declaratory judgments are what the those, you know, who enacted the APA, if Congress had in time, scholars at the time, Jaffe, thought that didn't, vacatur didn't occur to them. Remedial authority is a flexible concept, and so maybe the courts of appeals have expanded that concept. Why would that be impermissible? Well, I think it would be inconsistent with how the court ordinarily approaches these types of questions of statutory interpretation. And I think if you agreed with us that this is not what Congress meant to authorize when it enacted Section 706 of the APA, then there would be kind of no basis to alter the text at this date and to suggest that actually the court can read into that language that all agree was not intended to cover vacater. But set aside is broad, right? It's not specific. And even in 703, it says including actions for declaratory judgments or writs of, you know, prohibitory or mandatory injunctions. It doesn't exclude it. And given that set aside is broad, you know, it's, 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 you know, you're asking for a narrowing construction of it. And I guess what I'm saying is when set aside could be read to include vacater, doesn't preclude it. Why is it not subject to evolution? Well, I think that there's an a, additional problem here with trying to expand it in that basis insofar as it would expand beyond party-specific relief, and that implicates its own considerations under Article Three, uh, and implicates the same arguments we've been making about nationwide injunctions, that when courts issue remedies that go beyond the parties in the case, it can take courts beyond the traditional forms of relief that are authorized, whether under Article Three or under the statute. So I think here, reading into the statute a new unprecedented remedy that would apply on the agency action itself instead of with respect to the parties would be problematic. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up because I have a question about that too. Why don't you treat this then as a jurisdictional argument? You can see that vacatur could be appropriate in a special statutory scheme, but say simply that as a matter of statute, statutory interpretation, that APA doesn't authorize it. Why isn't it a matter of Article III jurisdiction? Why do you concede that it would be accept accept acceptable if Congress specifically authorizes it? Well, you know, as this court well knows from its various cases, trying to parse that line on whether specific statutes are jurisdictional or not, uh, it, it can often require Congress to speak very clearly if it's trying to attach that jurisdictional label. And here, with respect to the remedies that the APA contemplates, we no, don't... No, 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 I mean as a matter of Article III. As a matter of Article III jurisdiction, you know, I guess it would be possible to think about it that way. We haven't made that argument, but I wouldn't want to shut the door on it uh, mm -hmm. because of the... the particular concerns with extending beyond party-specific relief. Last question on jurisdiction. You know, in response to some of Justice Gorsuch's questions about whether we should interpret 1252 to be um, a preclusion of remedial authority or actually tied into jurisdiction, you said you thought it was jurisdictional. If you think that the APA doesn't authorize the remedy of vacatur, is that jurisdictional? We By that same logic, I mean. So no, because I think if the APA doesn't authorize vacater in the first place, then you wouldn't have any issue under Section 1252F1. So we're not disputing that a set-aside order in the terms of just setting an unlawful agency action to the side for purposes of rendering... No, no, no I, maybe I didn't articulate my question. Well, I understand that 1252 precludes jurisdiction. Yes. I'm saying that if a court lacks jurisdiction when it lacks the authority to issue a particular remedy... Why wouldn't we understand the APA then? Why wouldn't we understand this issue as a matter of statutory interpretation to be jurisdictional? Because if the district court is entertaining an action to award a particular kind of relief that it lacks authority to award, would that be jurisdictional? We have not previously argued that this APA limit is jurisdictional. Um, the reason we've made the arguments under 1252 is because it specifically says no court shall have jurisdiction to do this, and we think that that is Congress clearly acting to attach jurisdictional consequences to an exercise of remedial authority. But I take the point, and I think it might be possible to conceive of a jurisdictional basis as well if a statute is actually preventing a remedy from being ordered. Okay, last question. This one goes to the merits. So Justice Alito was asking you, um, you were kind of going back and forth with him about the complexities of making the determination whether a non-citizen even falls in one of these categories in the first place. 
And I just wanted to give you a chance to address how, you know, there's a portion of the statute that talks about your, um, it's in C, D. The Attorney General shall devise and implement a system to make available daily on a 24-hour basis um, to state, federal, and local authorities uh, to determine whether individuals arrested for such authorities for aggravated felonies or aliens, and then it, it goes on. Why isn't that where the discretion and the resources should be channeled as a matter of statute rather than into the holistic inquiry that the memorandum dictates? So I, I certainly acknowledge the point that Congress might have anticipated that it would be easier to make this determination about aggravated felony status, and it, it set up mechanisms to try to ensure that there was information sharing between the federal government and the states. And I think maybe Congress couldn't have anticipated the, the developments in this court with respect to the categorical approach and the legal complexities that would raise about trying to monitor any number of varied state statutes that can be drafted in, in very different ways, with the end result being that before it's possible to determine with certainty that someone is subject to 1226C2, it often involves an investment, a considerable investment of resources and consultation between officers and, and legal uh, advisors to try to ascertain the scope of that provision. But you do have such a system? Yes, we do have systems to share information between states and the federal government with respect to those who, who have criminal convictions in state court. Thank you.